to thank all of you for coming today. Uh, what we've got going today is a, the last of the War and Peace panel discussions for the year. Um, Whether we're talking about Israel, terrorism, Iraq, one thing that I think we can all agree on is that the Bush administration's policies most recently and over the last five years have been extraordinarily controversial. Uh, I, I think we can agree on that. <laughs> I'd like to thank, uh, in particular, Ken Yowitz for supporting the War and Peace program over the last couple of years. I'd like to thank the members of the Dickey Center for providing financial support for events like these and a variety of other ones that aren't quite so visible to the public. Um, let me tell, just take one more minute. I'm going to reserve as much time for both the panelists and for discussions to tell you about our ground rules. Each of the four of our panelists will have about 15 minutes to speak and present their views. They've been given quite broad latitude about what it is that they would like to speak about. In other words, I didn't want to dictate have my views dictate about what they think is important in terms of what they should talk about. Um, once we get through our go-round, the floor will then be turned over to you. I will moderate then questions from the floor to any or all of the panelists. Our first speaker today is Sinan Antoun. He's a doctoral candidate in Arabic literature at Harvard University, and he teaches Arabic here at Dartmouth College. He's published articles and poems in both Arabic and in English. He is studied English literature at Baghdad University before coming to the United States in 1991 under the conditions of the first American Gulf War there. He did his graduate studies in Georgetown prior to going to Harvard. He returned to Iraq two years ago in 2003 as a member of Encounter Productions to film a documentary about the lives of Iraqis in post-Saddam Hussein Iraq. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and for the Dickey Center, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, although the general idea is to provide uh, pro prognostications and advice on what is to be done now, I will spend most of my uh, brief comments about what went wrong in the past, because I fear that unless we deal with that, things will uh, keep repeating themselves. Uh, and of course, 15 minutes, too many generalizations, I apologize. Uh, in addressing the issue of foreign policy, U.S. foreign policy, especially as it pertains to the Middle East, one must grapple with a certain amount of frustration, whether as a concerned citizen, an observer, or a student and scholar of the culture and politics of that region. It is particularly frustrating today because one can no longer assume that the policymakers are interested in listening to critical voices or are willing to acknowledge mistakes and pitfalls if and when these are identified. Not that people in power anywhere are necessarily or usually keen on listening to detractors or critics, but this current administration has truly outdone itself in this respect and will surely go down in history as one of the most arrogant and unwilling or even incapable of learning from its mistakes. To the contrary, it rewards and promotes those amongst its ranks who conceived of, promoted, and conducted a series of disastrous political and military decisions that have cost billions of dollars and thousands of lives. Need I mention the names Wolfowitz, Rumsfeld, and Rice, to name just a few, and also, for example, Bremer, who was appointed as the governor of Iraq. And we can all agree now that uh, his tenure was disastrous. He was given a medal a few months ago if you've all noticed, as well as Tommy Franks and the ex-head of the CIA. So the situation is very um, absurd, to be honest with you. I am compelled to mention this at the outset because our contributions and discussions are meant to inform our fellow citizens whose interests and lives and the lives of their loved ones are at stake here, and ideally to help them make better decisions as citizens and hold politicians accountable when the time comes. Yet most of the citizenry has forgotten a most important American tradition, dissent. Alas, the 9-11 tragedy 
and the manner in which it has been exploited by this administration to create a climate of fear where dissent and criticism are, are conflated with disloyalty. This has severely limited the space for critique and genuine public dialogue. Add to all of this the Manichaean view, worldview parroted by the president and the incessant mystification of politics and history by employing amorphous and convenient concepts such as evil and hate and whatnot. With a largely docile and embedded media that has forgotten its primary function in democracy, there isn't much room for optimism. But I'll give you some at the end. <laughs> Again, I deliberately mention all of this because once the phrase the Middle East or any of its constituent parts is uttered in public, it will automatically bring to mind a host of mystified categories, primarily Islam and the so-called clash of civilization thesis, which although heavily critique was revived after 9-11 in the general media and even amongst in academic circles. And here I must stress that the portrayal of contemporary politics and history in religious terms serves only to deflect attention from material reality. Religions, especially monotheisms, have always been exploited for political ends in the most violent and abhorrent ways. The world's history and the West's history is crowded with examples. Islam is no exception, and if we consider the political violence that uses Islamic terminology as somehow exceptional, we will only be wasting time and missing the point. Our analysis and observation should not be focused on texts or scripture, but on actions, events, and socio-political realities. So my comments today are based on the belief that politics and history are simply made and unmade by men and women, not by texts. History determines what texts mean and not vice versa. Thankfully, today in the New York Times, maybe some of you have already read it, there was an op-ed piece by a professor of politics at Chicago, who I'm told was teaching here, by the name of Pape, and he has studied suicide bombings in, in, the, in the last three, four decades, and he has come to the conclusion that religion has nothing to do necessarily with suicide bombings. We know that the Tamil Tigers, for example, have conducted more suicide bombings than Hamas or Hezbollah. He ties it to military occupation. Wherever you have military occupation, you will have suicide bombings. So if you want to get rid of suicide bombings and military occupations. Before answering the question of the day, where to go from here, we must first discuss how we got here in the first place. Because the same assumptions and actions that got the US into where it is are still operative. Because of time constraints, I will focus mainly on US policy towards Iraq for obvious reasons, with a few references to Saudi Arabia. And before doing that, we must dispense with one myth with which many fellow citizens are unwilling to part company. And that is that US foreign policy mirrors, promotes, or somehow tries to live up to cherished American ideals. Thus, we, in quotes, and this we in itself is a very problematic term as it conflates us, the citizenry, with the government, and that is a convenient rhetorical tool, but not without its own pitfalls, especially nowadays. So I'm always wary when people say we, because that includes everyone. We try to do good in the world when we can. US actions abroad, for the most part, are deemed in the collective imaginary to be liberatory and pro-democratic. Most Americans think of images of GIs being welcomed as liberators in France, for example. Alas, that was one of the few exceptions, rather than the norm, throughout the world and I need not, need not go through the list of ruthless dictators actively supported by the government of the US in the past and even in the present, justifications notwithstanding, especially and in the Middle East. And also examples of democratically elected governments toppled by military juntas aided and abetted by the United States. Many examples, Musaddaq and the Shah in Iran, Allende in Chile, Saddam Hussein. It's a very terrible thing, but we have to contend with it. This myth is being used right now to divert attention from the initial narrative used to lead the nation to a costly war and to justify continued occupation in Iraq. The traditional line now is that, okay, there are no WMDs, but Saddam was an evil dictator and we took him out, and since we're there, let's help those folks build a democratic state. This is what you hear in many forms and read all over the place. This proposition is ludicrous, to say the least. Let us remember that spreading democracy and liberating Iraqis was never the goal of this war when it was being sold 
to the citizenry for a year before the war started. It was rather the imminent threat of a mushroom cloud over New York which Saddam could produce in 45 minutes as we were told by Condoleezza Rice and Dick Cheney all over TV, all over the newspapers. Alas, the public's attention and memory span is very short. Now, if the US's goal in the Middle East is to promote democracy, one wonders why it consistently supported the Saudi regime for half a century, for example, which is, by any standard, one of the most ruthless, undemocratic, and brutal regimes in the world, a regime that doesn't allow its women to drive cars, simply. But Laura Bush and Lynn Cheney are interested in Afghani women, and they have photo opportunities with them, but not with Saudi women. It seems to me that Saudi Arabia, rather than Iraq, was more worthy of some liberation, especially after 9-11. Uh, anyway, the liberation argument is hollow and is not consonant with reality. We can discuss that in the Q&A. It is en vogue now to write articles and books about the evils of the Saudi regime and its conservative Wahhabist ideology. But one wonders where were these voices in the past, especially in the 1980s during the Afghanistan war when Saudi Arabia was an ally in the war against the evil empire of the time, the Soviet Union. In those days, Mujahideen and Jihad, very evil word nowadays, were positive categories because the cannons were directed at the Soviets. Some Mujahideen were even invited to the White House. You can check it, it's out in the public record. They were hailed by President Reagan as freedom fighters. I mention this because it crystallizes the central problem in US foreign policy in the Middle East, and that is myopia and the incessant desire for short-term goals without any consideration for the enduring disasters they produce. The consistent support, military and otherwise, of dictatorial regimes and corrupt fiefdoms and sheikhdoms in the Gulf for whatever reason, for whatever gain, be it cheap oil, as in the case of Saudi Arabia, or posing as a regional policeman, as in the case of the Shah and later Saddam, all this has a price that will continue to haunt us for a long time. The US government is now, for example, spending your tax money to promote reform in Saudi Arabia and encourage moderate voices in the region. So we are told. But uh, three major secular reformers, for example, were jailed uh, four months ago. These are not Islamic reformers. Secular reformers were jailed four months ago and day before yesterday, they were sentenced to nine years in prison for simply calling for democratic elections. Of course, not a word anywhere in these great programs on TV, not a word in the New York Times, which is considered the bastion of the left. All of that goes unnoticed, and Thomas Friedman and others write articles telling us how there are no voices of secular reform in the Arab world. But there are voices, and they're not heard, of course. Decades of support to dictatorial regimes that crushed leftist and secular-minded opposition because they were sympathetic <coughs> to Marxism or deemed pro-Soviet ensured that the last resort for mobilization would be religious discourse. If you have a situation where organizing and mobilizing political parties is banned and public meetings for political reasons are also banned, the mosque becomes de facto the center of communal activity. I always like to mention Sadat, for example, because in the public discourse here, he is always portrayed as the enlightened man of peace because he was our ally and our man. Sadat single-handedly is responsible for encouraging and for the growth of what is deemed to be Islamic fundamentalism in Egypt and in the region because simply in his effort to crush the left again in Egypt, most of it was socialist, he threw all of them in jail, threw hundreds of intellectuals, secular, liberal, Western-minded intellectuals into jail, and released many of the members and the activists of the Muslim Brotherhood who were in jail in order to offset the left, releasing all the Muslim brethren and giving them free reign in order to offset the left. Also, he uh, kind of, I mean, to prove my point, he allowed, he's called enlightened, he allowed for uh, open building of mosques without permits. In the past, you used to have permit to build a mosque. He uh, gave a free hand to people, anyone, to build mosques, which I'm not against to say, but when you have no really freedom for, of expression and no public space, but you have proliferation of mosques, you automatically create a network uh, and a space for mobilization and organization. Later, of course, he cracked down on the Muslim brethren because they were against his rapprochement with Israel and whatnot, and he was assassinated by one of them. I mention these things because, once again, 
uh, in crushing the, the later the Muslim brethren and putting them in jail and violating all kinds of human rights violations, he was all the time allied with the United States. So in the eyes of people over there, the United States is seen as an ally of a dictator. One important example to think of is Ayman al-Zawahiri, the number two man in al-Qaeda, was one of those prisoners under Sadat's regime. And he was severely tortured. I'm not justifying anything he does or says, but we have to think of these things and see how past actions continue to affect uh, the situation today. When this support to dictatorial regimes is coupled with military presence, irrespective of justifications, its effects are even more lethal. Let us not forget that the presence of US troops in the Arabian Peninsula after 1990 is the central theme in Osama bin Laden's rhetoric and the primary reason behind the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Striking alliances with brutal regimes that oppress their own population cannot earn the US the sympathy of those populations. Because the line you hear now is why do they hate us? They don't really hate you or me as people who live here. They hate the actions of the United States and the military and the regimes that the United States allies itself with. I come to Iraq. I don't know how much time I have left. Five only? Seven. Seven, thank you. Again, the question is what went wrong? And you have to think of the assumption as if everything was right and there was this little glitch and then everything went, you know. Uh, perhaps it should be the other way around. It's simpler to say what went right because so many things went wrong. Pundits and pseudo pundits are shocked that things went horribly wrong. As the citizenry was led to this war, many voices around the world and here in this country were screaming that the consequences of a war would be disastrous to both Iraqis and Americans. But at the time, they were explained away and accused of being Saddam lovers and whatnot. Injecting some history and facts into the discussion is all one needs to realize that what is happening now was bound to happen. Why were American soldiers not greeted as liberators as promised by Vice President Cheney and other experts? A simple question whose answer will illuminate a great deal about the issue. A number of historical facts ensured that that would never be. I have to go back to some brief history of Iraq. Saddam came to power in 1979, a few months before the Iranian Revolution, which toppled the ruthless Shah, our old friend, by the way. We have to remember that. I'm not a fan of theocracies, but I'm no fan of secular dictators either, like the Shah. In September of 1980, Saddam started the Iran-Iraq War, which lasted for eight years. The international community was not rigorous in its efforts to stop that war. And we can get into that later. Saddam's regime was seen as a good buffer against Iranian fundamentalism, never mind that he was butchering his own population and executing thousands of people. Henry Kissinger, a very respected figure in Washington, D.C., said, quote, the longer the war lasted, the better it would be for U.S. interests as it would weaken both regimes. The US allies in the Gulf, namely Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, were given the green light to support Saddam with billions of dollars to finance the war. The weaponry, of course, to sustain that war was coming from France, Britain, China, Brazil, the Soviet Union, and later the United States. The entire civilized world was supporting this really gruesome war. And now we come to the really important facts, which will explain why, in, in Iraq in particular, and in the Middle East, uh, you, um, American soldiers are not seen as liberators. Um, in 1982, President Reagan sends Donald Rumsfeld as his emissary to Saddam to reestablish diplomatic relations with Iraq because they were cut off. This is really at the height of Saddam's brutality against the population. So for me, having grown up in Iraq, and for many Iraqis, when we see Rumsfeld on the screen, what we see in the background, in superimposed is him shaking hands with Saddam in 1982. That signaled um, st uh, a renewed uh, diplomatic relationships between Iraq and the United States and significant support by the Reagan administration for Saddam's regime financially with uh, military intelligence and whatnot. And it continued under uh, Bush one. Ironically, also at the time, Rumsfeld was the emissary of Bechtel at the time, it was doing business with Saddam, the evil dictator, and now Bechtel is also rebuilding Iraq after overthrowing the brutal dictator. <laughs> I mention this because uh, how many of you saw that picture? It appeared only once on CNN, and Rumsfeld was really upset that it, was, it appeared. We, the citizenry, should have been informed about the previous actions of people in this administration and how they dealt with these issues. 
Um, then in 1990, we have the invasion of Kuwait when Saddam went really beyond the, the, the prescribed borders. And then all of a sudden, new and resolutions become so hollow and sacred that they have to be implemented. Once again, in the Middle East, we have UN resolutions that have to do with Israel and Palestine that have been sitting on the shelf for 50 years, never implemented. But then when it comes to Kuwait, because it's a rich fiefdom, all of a sudden, the entire civilized world is so upset about the invasion of Kuwait. Don't get me wrong, I was against the invasion of Kuwait. But everyone was rushing to implement UN resolutions. All of a sudden, they attained this, uh, this hollowness because they had to do with the rich fiefdom of Kuwait. Um, there were sanctions imposed against the Iraqi regime, supposedly to force Saddam out of Kuwait, but the sanctions did not work, so they went to war. The mandate of the war was to eject Saddam out of Kuwait, but in the meantime, there was a massive bombing campaign of the entire country that destroyed the infrastructure of Iraq. To quote one of the generals in the Pentagon said at the time, we bombed the country back to the pre-industrial age. I mention this because it bears upon what is happening now in Iraq and how that the social fabric of the society has disintegrated. Um, Bush, towards the end of the war, when it was obvious that Saddam was defeated, Bush on the radio tells Iraqis to, quote, take things, take matters into their own hands. Large number of Iraqis, especially the Shiites and the Kurds, believe that this means if you rise up, we will support you. They rise up, 16 out of the 18 provinces in Iraq fall to their hands, but there is deafening silence from the US and Britain, and then there are, uh, pronouncements that this is an internal matter and we will not support it, and that a devil you know is better than a devil you don't know. And in the ceasefire agreement signed between Saddam and General Schwarzkopf, Saddam is allowed to use helicopters. Saddam gets the idea that his regional role is finished, but he will be allowed to stay. So he proceeds to crush this uh, uprising, killing thousands and thousands of people and burying them in mass graves, which is terrible, of course, but the amazing thing is now these mass graves are exhumed and they're visited by Rumsfeld and so many of the people who were in the administration and did not support the uprising. It's used now, these mass graves are used to justify this war. Uh, another important thing is that the 91 Gulf War decimated the rank and file of the Iraqi army and left the Republican guards, which were Saddam's buffer, left them intact. So it was obvious that the United States did not want to really remove Saddam, but just wanted to get him out of Kuwait. I have two minutes left. Uh, the sanctions, most draconian sanctions in history, sanctions did not work to eject Saddam out of Kuwait, but they kept him in place saying maybe they'll weaken him. From 1990 until 2003, they end up killing one million civilians. Um, most of the middle class is decimated, leaves the country. Three and a half million Iraqis live outside of Iraq. This is important because how can you rebuild a country if all the professors, all the teachers, all the doctors have left the country, if the infrastructure is completely destroyed? So this whole talk about you know, Iraq rebuilding itself is really hollow because the material reality is not there anymore. All the bases, all the analysis, all the statistics are based on the 80s, not on the reality. Madeleine Albright was asked, on 60 Minutes in 1996 that this policy, which, which is, was killing at the time 100,000 civilians a month and 5,000 children under the age of 10, is it worth, is any political objective worth that policy? And she, she said yes on 60 Minutes. You can check it. Now Saddam, because the state was weakened, revives the tribal structure, uh, adopts Islamic rhetoric to appease the population and whatnot, so he abandons his secularism. Uh, I mention this because that might explain how everyone tells us Iraq was a very secular society, had a large and vibrant middle, middle class, but no more because no one talks about what 13 years of sanctions did to that country. Um, one more thing, it's important, as if it's the, 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 what crushes the whole thing. Upon entering Baghdad, the U.S. troops, where do they go? They leave all the public uh, buildings and they protect the Ministry of Oil and the Ministry of Interior. What kind of message does that send to the Iraqis? Why are we here? What are we doing? The, the occupation must really end as soon as possible because the whole argument for the war is hollow. Now it was built on a huge lie. More importantly, forget about human rights, forget about the rights of the Iraqis. For us as US citizens, 
billions and billions of dollars are being wasted and are going to the big corporations. I know that doesn't sound very popular because it sounds like some anti-capitalist rhetoric, but if you check the statistics, you see that. And 1,600 men and women died for the wrong reason. There is no timetable to withdraw from Iraq. This is what's making a lot of the Iraqi government suspicious. And Senator McCain says we're going to be staying there for 10 or 20 years. More importantly, your taxpayer money is going to building 10 permanent military bases in Iraq. Unless the United States leaves Iraq and hands it over to some kind of international body, uh, things will only get worse. Thank you. inviting me. It's very nice to see some old favorite faces in the audience. Um, I'd like to begin by summing up <coughs> my answer to, to Professor Stam's guiding principle question, which was Iraq or the Middle East, where do we go from here? The Irish answer would be, I wouldn't start from here. Unfortunately, this is where we are. And while I think that the invasion of Iraq was uh, successful in that it um, deposed a horrible regime, I think it did so, it, the invasion was for all the wrong reasons. That aside, uh, where do we go from here? The answer, I would say, depends on our assessment of three core things, legitimacy, legacy, and learning. I'm going to look at these three, uh, one after the other, but in true Irish fashion, I'm going to start with learning first. I thought, when we look at American foreign policy, that maybe I should go to the people who are in positions of power. And this, I found a very Irish response to notions of questions of power. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough for me, so I decided to go to the people I know and trust. Namely, Declan Lynch. Declan Lynch is a Dartmouth 03. He took uh, two courses. I was lucky enough to have him as a student of mine for two courses, one on Northern Ireland and one on ethnic conflict. Declan is currently a Marine in Ramadi. So I said to Declan, hi, I'm off to Dartmouth to have a chat about Iraq and the Middle East. What do you think they need to know? And Declan very kindly took time from Iraq to write me a very considered letter, which um, I won't read in total or in full, but I've, I've summarized as best I can without upsetting him, and I really don't want to upset an American Marine, um, to a concise form. This is what Declan says. The current mission of coalition forces in Iraq is to mentor and train Iraqi security forces. They f we face a relatively benign population. A majority of Iraqis seem ambivalent to our presence, in some cases content for the security we provide. But all of this is conditional based on a relationship between the coalition forces and insurgents. The need for Marines to treat every Iraqi as a potential threat makes it impossible to establish trust. Trying to win the hearts and minds of a population with everyone suspect. Now, for those of you who aren't sure, Declan is in Ramadi. Ramadi is north of Fallujah. Um, his, he was sent there, I think, in February. So he's been there three or four months. And what he, what he wrote in the next part of the letter I found particularly poignant, because Declan is an Irish citizen born in Ireland who took American citizenship in order to become a Marine. I had issues with this, being an Irish person from a neutral country, thinking, what, why would you want to become an American? So you're going to become a Marine. Um, and this is what Declan, who's a real paddy, if I can say that as an Irish person, this is what I found telling. <coughs> Declan said, this has been an eye-opener for me, allowing me to equate my mindset with that of the British soldiers in Northern Ireland. The single advantage we have with the local population is the lack of legitimacy the insurgents have. They have no political aims and offer no concrete solutions to the problems the Iraqis have. The goal, as far as I can imagine, 
is to get the Iraqi security forces to a level of competence so they can withstand the first two months after a coalition withdrawal. All we can do is prepare them and leave. And that's where he left me. His letter ends with all we can do is prepare them and leave. So in light of that, and in light of Declan's letter, I thought about issues of legitimacy, legacy, and learning. What can we learn? What legacy does the US, and I mean we in the very apologetic current collective sense rather than the American sense, um, what can we learn and what do we mean when we talk about legitimacy? Firstly, let's have a look at legacy. De Tocqueville said there are two things that a democratic people will always find very difficult, to begin a war and to end it. If we take a look at, at one of President Bush's State of the Union addresses, we see that a sea change has happened in American foreign policy in relation to the Middle East. Bush said, 60 years, after 60 years, in 60 years, the Western nations excu had an excusing, excused the lack of freedom in the Middle East. He said, security is not purchased at the cost of liberty. In effect, the Bush policy for the Middle East has become one of democratization, not in the fluffy sense of democratization that we all seem to know and love. But democratization has become a strategic goal, not a luxury, but now a strategic priority for the Middle East. In relation to legacy, what, who can we learn from? And the answer, as ever, and I say this as an Irish person, is the British. In 1918, Woodrow Wilson said that the 12 Turkish parts of the Ottoman Empire need sovereignty like other, nation need sovereignty like other nationalities. The other nationalities, quote, should be assured an undoubted security of life and an unmolested opportunity of autonomous development. This is very telling when we think about the current position of the Kurds in the, the Kurdish part of Iraq. Thomas Owens, the US consul in Baghdad said in 1920, and if you forgive the date and just look at the quote, the whole show seems to be a farce and no steps have yet been taken which indicate a sincere desire to set up an autonomous government in Mesopotamia. John Raldorf, the US consul in Baghdad in 1924 said, whole areas of the country are scenes of robbery and pillage. It does not appear possible to deny that the British and Iraqi authorities have accomplished much towards the introduction of order, government, and justice into the trouble center of the country. Now, what did this mixed bag of references to Iraq in 1920, when the British cobbled together a three-area, um, three-region area dynamic for, for what is now modern-day Iraq, compiling three different distinct ethnic, ethno-national groupings, um, carving Kurds from their neighbors, um, and cobbling together a, an organization or a state based on, on ability to organize and monopolize. For the Americans, what can this mean? Now bear in mind that in the 1920s, America was viewed very differently in the Middle East. The US consul in Baghdad's letter to the State Department, or rather their update, which probably was not sent by email and was probably much slower. They said, the name of the president is upon the lips of the people of Baghdad a great deal these days by Muslims, Christians, and Jews, bear in mind there were some in Baghdad at this time, it is invariably the president who is mentioned as a representative of a disinterested nation which is seeking to secure the liberties and happiness of the oppressed people of the world and a reign of justice and righteousness for all. So the view of America in Iraq in the 1920s was a very different perception. What does this mean for us in relation to legitimacy? If you recall Declan's letter, Declan says that the only thing that, that differentiates the US from the um, insurgents is that the insurgents have a lack of legitimacy. Declan argues that the insurgents in Iraq appeal to the base level, namely the, the, the lack of desire for some people for the, the occupying forces in Iraq. What's interesting here is that don't be cajoled or manipulated by terms. When we say occupying forces in Iraq, the term is not a derogatory term as we usually associate occupying forces with. When I say occupying forces, I'm using the term that the transitional administrative law implemented in March 2003 used. When Bremer, for all his ills, uh, decided along with Jeremy Greenstock, the British person in the same position as Bremer, Greenstock, I would say sensibly, convinced Bremer that when it came to the transitional administrative law in Iraq, the term occupation should rightfully be used. The Americans are occupiers for a reason to assert that they're not pretending to be anything else. The occupation will end and they will leave. 
And that was a very important point to make, to make the term occupation transparent so it wouldn't necessarily be a derogatory or negative term. So legitimacy is key and crucial. And the issue of legitimacy is one that most are conscious and conscientious about. <laughs> legitimacy comes in two forms, in relation to government at least. Input legitimacy and output legitimacy. Namely, the nature of legitimacy afforded to a government, where, where the credibility or, comes from and how valid it is that they are where they are. Output legitimacy is a different beast. Output legitimacy is when the government produces the goods. Accountability, facilitating the necessary needs of the, of the population. Now, when we look at legitimacy in relation to Iraq, we have to deal with the nature of the occupying forces, the coalition forces, and the um, incumbent transitionary government in Iraq itself. What's interesting about this, and um, we've alluded already to the role of, of um, UN resolutions and their legitimacy, or their perceived legitimacy, some being more equal than others. It's interesting to look at UN Security Council Resolution 1511. In March 2003, this Security Council Resolution was pivotal, especially after the occupation of Iraq. It reaffirms the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Iraq, and it suggests that, this is, that it resides with the state itself. The words of the resolution are reaffirming the right of the Iraqi people freely to determine their own political future and control their own natural resources, reiterating its resolve that the day when Iraqis govern themselves must come quickly. We've already learned today that there is no consensus as to the date of exit. Interestingly, the one date we do have is the date for Halliburton's renewal of, of um, its, its contracts in Iraq. 2011, in case you were wondering. This was from March 2003. 2011 is, ooh, any mathematicians? How many years between 2003 and 2011? Eight, hmm. How many electoral spins can we get through? At least two, if things work well. So the idea is the argument for a consolidated democracy, when do we argue that things settle and turn, is two electoral turns. What's interesting about this is that in the, state, in the case of Iraq, electoral turns are a different thing. And here's why. The UN Council resolution that I mentioned secured foreign government participation in Iraq, and critically, it ensured foreign investment in Iraq. Now, what's interesting about this is that the transition administrative law that I've alluded to previously in 2003 is a very telling law. Because when Greenstock, the English guy, and Bremer, the American, well, you know that, when Greenstock and Bremer got together, the question was, what, what kind of legitimacy do we give and how do we assert legitimacy? Which comes first, the government, the election, or the constitution? The answer is, if you have a chicken and an egg problem, throw up lots of chickens and lots of eggs. The remedy was to create a transition administrative law that would function, which they did in March, establish elections in January, which we've had, January of this year, have an, uh, an interim government determine and create the position for creating a committee to write the constitution, which, all things being equal, will happen in August, all things being unequal, will be pushed ahead another three months. And finally, have an election to legitimize the constitution and those who've written the constitution in December. If you can't determine which comes first, the chicken or the egg, you create two elections and one constitution. An election to elect the people to determine the constitution and an election to validate that constitution. That sounds very cozy. The difficulty we have with this, of course, is that the nature of Iraq is such that we have an awful lot of different actors and players involved. What's pivotal here, and the word pivotality is critical, is the role of the Kurds and the nature of the system in Iraq and the way that it's organized in 18 regions. Interestingly enough, Saddam Hussein opted for 18 regions and no one could think of another way to divide the place up any better, so it's still 18 regions. For the constitution to be validated, 16 of those regions have to endorse it. And the difficulty with this is that the Kurds have an optimal position to be able to let the constitution spin arguably on a Kurdish whim. So we have problems with this dynamic, even though our attempts to make legitimacy work are, um, are clear and transparent. The what ifs happen. What if the elections, ha well, the constitution happens and it works and the Kurds get the deal that they need? What if Iraq then becomes one of the following? A weak client democracy, a new regime that appears to validate regional conspiratorial theories about the US and its roles. That's going to be a problem. What if Iraq becomes weak 
and is divided up, up, up between feuding and warring Kurdish Sunni Shiite factions in what's created, what in, in a power vacuum that's created as a result. That's going to be problems. That's going to cause problems. What happens if Iraq is weak and this intensifies Turkish, Iranian, and Syrian competition for influence in the region? If we, know, if we look at the recent um, events in, um, in the region, we can see that there are dynamics where Syria and Iran are playing to the Caspian and to the northern states in a very interesting dynamic which has yet not played out its full part. What happens if Iraq adopts a theocratic tilt? It creates greater regional instability and increases the destabilization. What happens if it becomes a strong United States and acts as though it has power and attempts to concentrate its internal development from there? It'll attempt to rebuild its forces and rearm. When it does that, the rest of the region feels uncomfortable again. <coughs> to rebuild its military creates tension. The tension is in no way undermined by the role of the, um, by the, role of the uh, Kurdish um, Pashmurga, who interestingly the Kurds have said that's their, the Kurdish force that is unified and cohesive and they have said there's no way they will undermine or, or have their Peshmerga uh, disband. So we already have problems in terms of how these things play into one another. Political and economic development is going to be critical and problematic. And then critically the issue of energy. And the critical thing about energy is the great unsaid. Lacan said that the unsaid is more important than the said and we're all talking about oil. But there's one critical thing that no one's mentioning and it's natural gas. Gas is big. And gas will be the big issue, not least for the reference to Kirkirk being a problem for the Kurdish areas. Gas is big, not least because there's a pipeline that goes from Kirkirk, an old, dusty, rusty British pipeline that goes from Kirkirk all the way to a little port on the coast of the Mediterranean. Anyone care to guess? Yes. So it'll be very interesting that we have this connection between the Kurdish autonomous area, whatever it will end up being, and um, Israel. So there are lots of ramifications for all of these facets within the region. Then we come to Iran. Policy learning for Iran. What can Iraq teach the Iranians who are currently a little bit tentative, or perhaps not tentative enough according to the Europeans? Iran lost its neighboring threat by having Saddam removed by the US. It was replaced by the fear of the US and what the Americans want to do with Iran. The issue of Rasanjani and his, his recent attempt to stand in the pending elections. Rafsanjani was the one who initiated political dialogue with the US and was very helpful in Afghanistan with dealing with Iran and Afghanistan. Rafsanjani, for those of you who are unaware, is also the king of pistachio nuts. Pistachios are big in Iran and Rafsanjani is the pistachio nut king. So clearly when it comes to Iranian product and, and exports, we don't want to be, in, incur sanctions on pistachios in Iran, whatever about oil. Natural parallels with um, informal Iranian-US cooperation over Afghanistan, we thought things were going well. Now, unfortunately, in relation to uh, uranium and the like, we have problems. Iranian Shia influence has a stronghold in, in Iraq, in, uh, but in, in the southern part of Iraq. Uh, in terms of religion, the key shrines for Shia Islam are in Iraq. Um, ideology, the issue of a theology in Iraq could be problematic in relation to the Iranian dynamic. Um, security. U.S. influence in the Gulf will be problematic, especially when you see how Iran and Iraq relate to one another. Energy and economics, again, oil production and the quotas, and critically, Iran's claims for reparations after the Iran-Iraq war. It's also worth noting here that Iran first attempted to gain access to high-powered, big-power state weapons under the Shah. And under the Shah in 1979, a deal was done with Israel to assist in the creation of of um, Israeli missiles that would be exported to Iran. So when the Ayatollah came in and changed the policy, it wasn't until the Iran-Iraq war that the Iranians lobbied strongly to try and access and re-improve and, and do something about their, um, their, their uh, capacity for weapons and missiles in particular. Because I don't want to race out of time and harass Professor Stam, um, Iranian-Iraqi strategy, what does this mean? What can the Iranians do in relation to Iraq? They can play, uh, Iranian Shias can be played off in Iraq against other factions. Um, the incentive is for the Iranians to internationalize the conflict so that the U.S. don't hold on to the influence. A tactical advantage is, is asserted here um, to try and assist in state building in a Shia-dominated region in particular. So this is Iran's interest. Um, Iranian relations with other Gulf states is, is strong, particularly. Um, and the, the military disadvantage facilitates a greater American dominance in the Gulf region, so they're competing there too. Iranian soft power. Um, at play in the sense that they charm the other Gulf states, even though maybe we can't quite see how. 
And nuclear proliferation with the EU, the EU is, um, according to the Americans, being insufficiently strong. The, Amer the EU policy in relation to Iran is speak softly and carry a big carrot. That's not necessarily something that's working for the, for the, um, for the Americans at the moment. So because I don't want to take too much time, I would argue that the Middle East is currently a Pandora's box of, of risks. Um, multiple problems, the Kurds, the dynamics in the region, um, the, the, the notion that all roads to Jerusalem go through either Baghdad, Tehran, uh, Beirut, uh, and Damascus is, is an interesting and telling one. And I'll leave you with that and, and wait for the questions. Thank you. In 1938, the eminent German writer Thomas Mann, who was already a refugee from Nazi Germany at that time, made a cross-country speaking tour of the United States. Subsequently, he published a short volume of his lecture entitled The Coming Victory of Democracy. Not a particularly timely title, you might say, in 1938. But Mann wrote, <laughs> Quote, democracy as a whole is still far from acquiring a clear conception of this fascist concentration, of the fanaticism and absolutism of the totalitarian state. It willingly sacrifices all culture and humanity for the sake of power and victory, and advances in the battle of life such as have never been seen before, whose effect upon civilization is wholly bewildering. And yet, in order to be able to survive, democracy must understand this new thing in all of its thoroughly vicious novelty. Democracy's danger is the humane illusion, the virtuous belief that compromise with this new creature is possible, that it can be won over to an idea of peace or collective reconstruction by forbearance, friendliness, or amicable concessions. I find a lot in those words that is relevant today. Substitute Islamism or fanatic Islam for fascism and much of what we are doing now falls into focus. I am a regular reader of the letters to the editor in the Valley News, so I know it is generally unpopular in this community to find anything positive in the policies of the evil neoconservative Bush administration, but I'll make an attempt to do so here this afternoon. Let me list a few basic thoughts that govern some of my thinking, thinking on where we are and where we should be headed. First, it is impossible to be entirely consistent in the field of international policy making. You may come close, but there are always going to be circumstances that drive you off course, at least temporarily. Second, for the last 50 years, especially the last 25 years, we pursued a policy in the Middle East that was often short-sighted and harmful to us and others, albeit with motives that were argu arguably justifiable. Third, our war in Afghanistan and our invasion of Iraq were both justified. Fourth, our policy of promoting freedom and democracy in the Middle East is overdue, wise, and welcome. Fifth, the overwhelmingly critical bias against Israel in Europe, the Middle East, and in certain US academic circles is wrong, unfortunate, and dishonest. And finally, Despite what you read and hear constantly in many quarters, the U.S. today is in a war with evil religious fanaticism, and we are on the side of the angels. How have we come to where we are today? In part, to be sure, through many years of mistaken policy. 
For too long, we treated the Middle East dictators differently from the way we treated authoritarian or dictatorial regimes elsewhere in the world. A less than democratic government in Latin America, whether of the right or of the left, was, off, was often a bone in our throat to be removed as quickly as possible. Twenty-some assorted dictators in the Arab world were to be cultivated and, if at all possible, to be made our friends. There were reasons for this, of course. Oil, clientitis on the part of the Near East Bureau and the Department of State, the feeling that the Arab world was just not meant to be democratic. But the policy was short-sighted and inherently flawed for a democracy like the United States. Further, we showed weakness to those who wished ill on us, and, judged our, and they judged our apparent weakness as an opportunity to diminish us. When Iranian students seized our embassy in 1979, when, and they were then supported by the Iranian government, I believe we should have recognized then that Iran had created a state of war with the United States, taking over U.S. territory and personnel in Tehran, and we should have acted accordingly. Instead, we tied yellow ribbons around trees, finally mounted an ill-fated rescue attempt, and were humiliated for 444 days by a lunatic, brutal government. We did essentially nothing while two of our embassies in Africa were blown up while we lost 17 sailors on the USS Cole in 2000, while 241 of our troops were killed in Lebanon in 1983, and when a first attempt was made to destroy the World Trade Center buildings in New York. John Lehman, a member of the 9-11 Commission, emphasized the, quote, utter failure of the government, our media, and our academicians to grasp the nature of the enemy. Everyone was throwing off terms, he said, and talking about terrorism and the threat of terrorism, but they utterly missed what was going on. We've utterly failed to grasp the breadth, spread, and depth of the enemy that we allowed to develop around the globe over some 30 years. So the U.S., under both Republican and Democratic administrations, sat and watched and did little or nothing. We knew there were terrorist training camps in Lebanon and Afghanistan and elsewhere, but we did nothing. What, we, what did we think that those thousands of trained people were being trained for? But as with the hostages in, in Iran, we did nothing until 9-11. Now, put yourself in George Bush's place, in the White House, your principal task as President of the United States being the protection of your citizenry. Bush took a position and made the decisions that have changed 50 years of U.S. policy toward the Middle East, and in the process, I would argue, open to the people of that benighted region the possibility of freedom, democracy, and a better way of life. For all of this, of course, Bush has been on the receiving end of some rather harsh criticism. Even the town of Hanover, no less, has seen fit to condemn his policy of preemptive war, though more recently it voted to support his policy of removing U.S. Uh, including New Hampshire National Guard troops from Iraq only at the request of the elected Iraqi government. Too, too quickly we forget that many opposed our going into Afghanistan, saying that we faced a quagmire and would eventually suffer the same fate as the Soviet Union did there. Our decision to remove the Ba'athist regime and Saddam Hussein from power continues to be the subject of much <laughs> argument and more than a little opposition to the president and those neoconservative advisors who apparently are running the world now, if one is to believe much of our media. Bush and Blair and Australia's John Howard uh, lied to the world about WMDs, we are told. They took us into Iraq on false pretenses. This is a topic for an entire presentation, but perhaps we can deal with it more in the question period. Let me just note here that probably 10 different intelligence services were all of the same opinion about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Perhaps they were all wrong. I say perhaps because I am still not entirely persuaded that chemical and or biological weapons, though not nuclear weapons, weren't smuggled out of Iraq, possibly to Syria at some time. Some argue that we let the UN inspect if we had let the UN inspectors do their job, they would have determined the absence of WMDs in Iraq. 
But the only reason inspectors got back into Iraq after four-year lapse was because of the presence of 200,000 Allies troops recently arrived there in the Gulf. Saddam was in, a vi in violation of some 16 Security Council resolutions. He was a known murderer who used weapons of mass destruction on his own people and in Iran. He was a sworn enemy of the United States. He had had contacts, though probably not a collaborative operational relationship, with Al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations. He was capable of passing WMDs to others to do what he likely would have wished to see done against the United States. He was among the most despicable dictators on the planet. So, if you were responsible for the security of the American public after 9-11, what might you have done? The president is a pretty awful public communicator, at least at a press conference or often in delivering a speech. He is better by far, I am told, when speaking to a small group. Many are convinced that he is hopelessly stupid, though none who believes this has gone through Harvard, Yale, two terms as governor of Texas, and been elected twice to the presidency. So how stupid is he really? Still, I suspect the president's inability to communicate nearly as effectively as did his predecessor colors much of the negative feeling toward him and toward our policy in Iraq and elsewhere in the Middle East. But that doesn't make the policy wrong. So what is the situation now? Most of what we read in our major papers and here on network television conveys a pretty grim picture in Iraq. New suicide bombings make headlines. Newly built schools or power stations don't even make it to page 15. I suggest to you that we are getting a pretty one-sided picture of the situation. That is hardly to say that all is right with the world in Iraq. But we should at least be asking, what else is going on in a country of 25 million people beyond what we read of bombs going off in the Sunni Triangle? And there has surely been some remarkable political progress in Iraq. The January 30th election that brought out 8 million voters despite threats of you vote, you die, was pretty impressive. Beyond Iraq, there have been other things happening that I think it's fair to say are also remarkable, new, and attributable to present U.S. policy in the region. Fuad Ajami of Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies recently noted, quote, the speed with which Syria quit Lebanon was astonishing, a race to the border to forestall an American strike that the regime could not discount. Jami continues, unmistakably, there is in the air of the Arab world a new contest about the possibility and the meaning of freedom. Our bargain, meaning the U.S. bargain, with authoritarianism did not work and begot us the terror of 9-11. The New Republic's Martin Peretz writes, history has never traveled in the Middle East as fast as it has during the last two years. In this place where t time seems to have stopped, Time has suddenly accelerated. The fact is, writes Peretz, that democracy did not even begin to breathe until the small coalition of Western nations led by the United States destroyed the most ruthless dictatorship in the area. Even the New York Times on March 1st of this year weighed in with an editorial entitled Mideast Climate Change, said the Times, it is not even spring yet, but a long frozen political order seems to be cracking all over the Middle East. Cautious hopes for something new and better are stirring along the Tigris and the Nile, the elegant boulevards of Beirut and the impoverished towns of the Gaza Strip. This has so far been a year of heartening surprises. This is from the New York Times. This has so far been a year of heartening surprises, each one remarkable in itself and taken together truly astonishing. The Bush administration is, to, is entitled to claim a healthy share of the credit for many of these advances. Where to go from here? First, recognizing that we can't and shouldn't attempt to deal with all the states in the Middle East in the same way, that it's impossible to be entirely consistent in international relations. We need to proceed carefully particularly in our dealings with countries like Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan. We will be accused of double standards, no doubt. 
But if we are true to our efforts to promote freedom and democracy, albeit in different ways and on different timetables in different countries, we may avoid some of the mistakes of the last 50 years. But always the U.S. must, to the maximum extent possible, be seen everywhere to be true to the principles on which this country is based and through which it has thrived. To be sure, there is no current substitute for Middle East oil. We are, for the time being, going to remain dependent on it. But that doesn't mean we have no cards to play. We must keep pressing for change, democratic change, in this region of the world where only one full-fledged democracy exists today. That, of course, would be Israel. With luck, Iraq will become a second. To those who are so critical of Israel's policies of self-defense and who attribute most of the problems of the Middle East to Israel's occupation of territory in Gaza and the West Bank, ask yourself what the chances were for resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict while there were at least three nations in the area, not to mention the Palestinian Authority, <coughs> sworn to the destruction of what they so carefully termed the Zionist entity. One of those three, Iraq, now has a different government. Syria and Iran remain problems. We shall have to expect setbacks in our efforts to bring democracy and freedom. Such changes do not go smoothly. We have, we have, we have had setbacks in our own history, to wit, a bloody civil war, the worst conflict of the 19th century. Mr. Bush has set a course that is risky, to be sure. Many argue that it is far too risky to justify the goal. They may be proven right, but if freedom and democracy can spread in the Middle East, the people of that region, the people of the United States, and people around the world will be safer and better off for the new policy now in place in Washington. Where to go from here? Pretty much just where we are going. Thank you. Before I begin my talk, I want to say that um, although the tone of many of the presentations so far is kind of gloomy about U.S. foreign policy, it's very, very heartening to me uh, in terms of the quality of discussion and debate here at Dartmouth. And I think, you know, frankly, I want to personally thank Al Stan, the director of the War and Peace Studies program, and also Ken Yalowitz, not simply for the normal thing, which is organizing a, a discussion and this sort of thing, but for, honest to God, presenting you guys with a range of differing viewpoints from the left to the right to give you guys different arguments from different sides, some of which you probably like, some of which you probably hate, but to give you the opportunity to wrestle with this. And I think that, frankly, all of us here at the community, whether you agree with half of them or two-thirds of them, we all benefit from this. So I want to thank them for that. And the second thing is I'm going to thank Al by 90% following his instructions. And you might think 90% isn't very good, but for a professor, following the instructions of the talk by 90% is actually quite good. Now, in case you're afraid that the major violation I'm going to make is by going over, I assure you that that's not the case. I will limit my uh, talk to uh, 15 minutes. What I'm going to do is Al asked us to talk about where we should go from here in Iraq. And feeling that that's such an easy answer, irony intended, that I wanted to do more than that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask where we should go from here in the Persian Gulf region, to some extent the Middle East. So I am going to focus on the present. I'm going to focus on my opinion. It's just my view on what we should be doing. But it's about what we should be doing in the Middle East and the Persian Gulf. So that's what I'm going to do. In the months after the 9-11 attack, um, from a variety of circumstances which don't merit going into here, I got the opportunity to give talks up and down the state of New Hampshire and then eventually all around the United States to citizens groups, um, people who came out to their local libraries just because they wanted to talk about U.S. foreign policy and have a sounding board for their ideas. And it, it was phenomenal to um, hear what people's questions were and what their frustrations were and how they were feeling. And one of the things that came through most clearly to me was 
a sense of frustration in a way because people would look kind of sheepish because they almost felt embarrassed to say it. But so many people would finally say things like, you know, I just wish America didn't have to be so politically enmeshed in the Middle East. It seems like such a nightmarish place. There are so many divides, so many factions. Everybody hates everybody. And the only thing they seem to agree about is they certainly hate us. And so can't we all just you know, reduce our involvement in there? But the reason there would be frustration was because they had the sense that every time that they said this, that they heard 14 good reasons why, well, it would be kind of nice if we weren't so deeply involved there, but there are really smart reasons which you only partially understand why we can't, why that's naive. And the two biggest reasons along these lines were oil and terrorism. And what I want to do today is actually, frankly, take the side of the frustrated guy in Des Moines, Iowa, who just wonders why we're so deeply enmeshed in a region where so many people don't share our values, where it's not clear what our interests are, et cetera, and really do two things. First is make the case that from the standpoint of U.S. national interests, neither the oil interest nor the problem of terrorism really requires us to have anything like the kind of foreign policy toward the Persian Gulf region that we currently have. That in fact, those aren't the, uh, the glue that pulls us into the Middle East. And the second thing I want to do is, again, we're short on time, but I just want to lay out an alternative foreign policy approach, which like all foreign policy approaches, has its pluses and its minuses. But I think, in my opinion, it overwhelmingly beats the approach that we're currently taking. Uh, an alternative foreign policy approach for the Middle East. One that allows the United States to protect what I think actually are our oil interests. Um, one that exposes or reduces our exposure to terrorism. And one that gets us a little bit out of this position of being so deeply enmeshed in a region where an awful lot of people don't seem to like us very much. Okay. So that's what I'm going to do in about 12 minutes. Let me start with oil. There's a simple topic. Um, the overwhelming question is this, is do U.S. oil interests really require a major political and or military presence in the Persian Gulf region? It's the million dollar question in a way. Um, some facts, in case you haven't noticed, the United States is a major consumer of oil. I can tell you the exact numbers if you want, but I think we can all accept that as a starting assumption. Fact number two is we import two thirds of the oil we consume, roughly. Um, while it's true that the vast majority of our imports do not come from the Middle East, that's irrelevant, as it turns out. And the reason it's irrelevant is because there's a global oil market. And if oil supplies were substantially disrupted in the Middle East, guess what the people who are importing oil from the Middle East would do? They'd start bidding away the oil from Mexico and Venezuela, which we're currently consuming. So if there was a major oil disruption in the Middle East, we'd all pay the cost of it at the gas pumps. So we are a major oil importer. and. Disruptions in the Middle East would create substantial costs on the U.S. economy. Economists disagree about the magnitude of those costs, but most would agree that if there was a major disruption, there would be substantial costs. So those are some facts. So the question that you should ask yourself then is, okay, given that we have this oil interest or we have this oil connection, um, what must the United States do to protect the global access of oil, uh, the global access to Persian Gulf oil? And here. I think there's some profoundly good news, because the answer is not all that much. Not all that much. Yes, it is in our interest that oil continues to flow from the Persian Gulf region, but not all that much has to be done to not only enjoy that situation now, but to preserve that situation in almost any conceivable circumstance in the future. Let me explain why. When people who are military planners in the U.S. government um, or foreign policy planners typically think about the scenarios where U.S. oil uh, Middle East oil production could really get screwed up by political events. Um, they focus on three types of scenarios. Number one is major conquest. So Iraq invades Kuwait and takes their oil, or Iraq invades Saudi Arabia. And what this could do, Iraq would still probably have an interest in selling this oil, right? But Iraq would suddenly have a big market share, and it could perhaps be a monopoly producer and dominate prices in ways that, don't, that we don't like, et cetera. So the first danger to US oil interests in the Persian Gulf is the danger of conquest. The second danger is somebody messing around with the sea lanes. People often point to Iran because it's close to the sea lanes, even though Iran benefits greatly from the flow of oil through the sea lanes. But that's the second danger people think about. And then the third danger, which I think is by far the most severe, 
is not international crises, but it's domestic crises. It's about civil war and insurrection within these crises. I mean, God forbid Al Qaeda folks get control of Saudi Arabia or something like this. Or maybe there's just an ongoing civil war in Saudi Arabia. So those are the three major dangers, political dangers, that people kind of think about when they think about how US oil interests could really get messed up in the Middle East. Well, the good news is that number one and number two, preventing conquest and keeping the sea lanes open, these are really easy things to deal with, frankly. Um, it sounds kind of scary when you're standing here and you haven't thought about it a lot, but from a military standpoint, preventing from country A in the Gulf, you choose which country, from conquering country B, is exactly the kind of thing the US military has been buying equipment and training for for 40 years to stop. Um, I worked for six or seven years, six and a half years as a consultant to the US Central Command, which is responsible for this region, and you know, you, a you ask the people in the command who are in charge of, of, of military plans, you know, how hard do you think it would be from US naval forces to stop Iraq from conquering the eastern province of Saudi Arabia? It's not hard. There's one thing the US Air Force is phenomenal about, uh, phenomenal at if it's not seizing control of airspace, it's destroying Iraqi armored vehicles in the desert. I mean, we get an A at that mission. So if you're afraid of Iran crossing the Persian Gulf and taking over Saudi Arabia or something, another mission the US military, what, what have you been getting for your $300 billion every year? We're really good at naval warfare. God, you know, God help the Iranians if they tried that. So again, it's not that you don't have to do anything. But if you talk to people who, in the, in the military who plan these things, you say, do you need to have a land presence in Saudi Arabia? Do you need to have an Air Force presence in Bahrain or Qatar? Could you stop these sorts of things if you keep a carrier in the Indian Ocean or maybe the Persian Gulf? The answer is yes. Perhaps you need a second carrier there, okay. But you don't need a major presence to prevent the conquest of oil. You don't need a major presence there during peacetime to prevent um, interdiction of the sea lanes. That's something you can do if Iran, for some crazy reason, decided to do that. What about the third mission, preventing regional instability? Is that an easy one to prevent or to undo? Absolutely not. But the irony there is that I think most people agree that US military presence in the region on a day-to-day -day basis actually makes this problem worse, right? It was our no longer existing, but our previous stationing of forces in Saudi Arabia, which caused all kinds of legitimacy problems for the Saudis and made them buy out the extremists who were running their education system, et cetera. It, so having major forces deployed in these monarchies, A, draws attention to us, rallies up the anti-American extremists who want to fly airplanes into our buildings, C, foments the kind of insurrection that really is the nightmare scenario in these oil producing states, and D, frankly, makes us look bad for the very good reason that we're propping up monarchies. I mean, in the 21st century, we're propping up monarchies. So again, US military presence in the region doesn't solve the problem of domestic instability in these countries. It actually foments it, and it foments it in a way that actually makes us look bad. So in sum, there are bad things that can happen to the world and to the US economy in the Persian Gulf via oil disruptions. But the good news is we don't need a big military presence in the region to prevent these things. And in fact, in some ways, accidentally our military presence makes this worse. We do need some presence around the region. I'll describe in a second what that is. But it's the kind of thing which will be much more beneficial to the United States. What about terrorism? And here I'll speak more quickly. The notion that we need to control Persian Gulf politics or have a big military presence in the region to prevent terrorism against the United States, frankly, has this exactly reversed. This is just backwards. And the reason it's backwards is um, you know, the one thing you can say about, about our enemies in the war on terror, and I think we do have enemies. I think our enemies are extremists who are joined in organizations like Al-Qaeda who are trying to kill us. The, the one nice thing you can say about them is they haven't been reticent about explaining why it is they're attacking us. I mean, frankly, I don't care why they hate us so much. I do care why they're attacking us. And they've, every time that a Western journalist would stick a microphone in their face, they'd tell them. And they frankly stayed on message. It's remarkable. You know, American <laughs> governments work really hard to keep everyone on message. They've stayed on message. And part of their message is it has something to do with US relationship with Israel, but it mostly has to do with US military presence in the Persian Gulf region. I mean, the, uh, Osama bin Laden's original declaration of war on the United States, and he went to the trouble. He wrote a document called the Declaration of War on, I can't remember the whole title because he's a wordy guy, but it was something along the lines of, 
the declaration of war against the infidels who are in the land of the two holy shrines, read Mecca and Medina. It's all about US presence in Islamic territory, et cetera. Um, so why do we think that the reason they're principally attacking us, not the only reason, but the reason they're principally attacking us is because of our presence in the Persian Gulf region. Number one, they say this at every opportunity they can to us, but they might be lying. Reason number two is if you look at their recruiting tapes, the things where they turn folks who hate America and the West into actual operational terrorists, which is the key thing, what do they talk about? They talk a little bit about the Arab-Israeli dispute, but they mostly talk about the US military presence in the Persian Gulf and the attempt to dominate Islam. So that's evidence number two. Evidence number three is we've seen this before. right? 20 years ago, these same folks were fighting a big war against somebody who they thought was trying to dominate Islam. Who was that? That was the Soviets. And they were in cahoots with us in this, right? We were helping them. They were cooperating with us. We supported Israel back then in the 1980s. But they could look beyond that because their main goal was get the people they perceive as the infidels out of Muslim lands. Well, the Soviets left, and the people who they now perceive as trying to prop up these corrupt dictatorships and be in Muslim lands is us. So when I look at this, the, the, the argument that says we must be in the Persian Gulf because otherwise these guys are going to fly airplanes in, in, into our building seems ludicrous to me on its face. Instead, what I would say is it is quite clear to me the members of al-Qaeda are our enemies. They would like to destroy our society. They would like to kill us. And the United States government should expend tremendous resources to try to destroy this group, to use diplomatic tools, to track them through money supplies, to use special operations missions, to use CIA, to use all the tools in the book, and also to do what, what the Bush administration intelligently did, which is to tell local governments that the days when you could permit anti-American terrorist groups to train in your country are over. And that you, Syria, for example, must make an equal effort to prevent anti-American terrorists from training in your country as you very effectively do at preventing anti-Syrian government groups from training in your country, namely stamp them out. I think all of that is very sensible. We are at war with al-Qaeda. We have to destroy al-Qaeda. But what this doesn't require, and that's what I really want to focus on, what this doesn't require is having a large military presence in the Persian Gulf region. Region. What it doesn't retire, require is defending and occupying Qatar or Kuwait or Saudi Arabia or any of these countries. All right, very last thing. What should we do then? Let me give you five, five points on what we should do. Number one, continue what we're doing against al-Qaeda. Um, one thing that the current administration, which I'm very critical of on other grounds, has done quite well is I think we need to recognize that while it's hard to interpret negatives, the fact that we haven't had a major terror attack on the United States since 9-11 is quite remarkable. And it probably is not unrelated to the fact that a large number of their senior leadership are in jail or being detained in some nasty holes in some unfriendly regime. Um, the Bush administration, I think, deserves some credit for really, so far, doing a pretty good job against al-Qaeda. And we should continue that. Number two is remove U.S. forces from the Persian Gulf region, from Kuwait, from Bahrain, from Qatar principally. Um, doing this, the big benefit would be it would reduce the visibility of U.S. forces. It would weaken the al-Qaeda recruiting posters. It would get us off their screen. They wouldn't have to look at us and blame us for all their troubles because we would just be over the horizon. Number three, we still have interests, oil interests, in the Persian Gulf, so you need to maintain a major na naval presence in the Indian Ocean. Good news, we can have one, two, three, four aircraft carriers in the Indian Ocean, and you could be standing on the Gulf, you know, in Saudi Arabia or Qatar or Bahrain, and you can't see it, right? So we can still maintain forces nearby, meaning the Indian Ocean, and keep somebody from conquering their neighbor or keep Iran from doing something crazy to the Straits, which they're almost certainly not going to do anyway, but not be in their hair. Um, number four, and I just feel like I'm obliged to say something about U.S.-Israel relations, and I guess what I would say, and talk more if you're interested in Q&A, is, is I guess my feelings about this are both good news and bad news for Israel. Um, the bad news is I do think, for reasons that, um, th that are not in the least bit hostile to Israel, frankly, I do think it is time for us to reevaluate the types and the levels of aid we give Israel. Not because they're a bad ally to the United States, but we should simply ask ourselves the question, gosh, Given that they are the wealthiest country in the region, given that they have the highest GDP per capita, they're technologically sophisticated, they also have the most powerful conventional military forces in the region. By the way, they also have nuclear weapons. 
they kind of look on their face like a country who can probably take care of its own national security problems. And so we should probably say, we're good friends of yours, you've been good friends of ours, but show some need. You know, you know, if your economy dives in the tank or if the Syrians get nuclear weapons, then maybe we'll reconsider. But for now, just on the basis of need, there are probably other people around the world who need our aid more than the Israelis. So I do think that's the bad news is we should reduce our aid, not as a punitive step, but just on the basis of need. The good news with regard to Israel is um, I don't think that we should be in the business of telling them exactly what details they're going to try to pursue to try to resolve their dispute with the Palestinians. You know, should the wall be two feet to the right or two feet to the left? Should it be eight feet or nine feet or seven feet? I mean, frankly, we can have a debate with the audience, with each other about, you know, we can go back to 1956 or 1958 or 2000 BC about who started what to who. Yeah, but yours was a reaction to this prior insult. Ah, but that insult was because of this previous grievance. And you know, for me, you know, I spent enough of my life, I looked this up, I tried to learn about it, and I finally threw up my, hair, my hands and I said, okay, enough, I don't think we're gonna come to a resolution about this. But when I kind of think about the Israeli situation, I kind of, what I come down on this is, you know, if, if for whatever reason, hundreds and hundreds of Al-Qaeda terrorists were infiltrating the Mexican-U.S. border and blowing themselves up in American markets, we wouldn't be asking for a show of hands at the U.N. about how high to build the fence or how low to build the fence or whether there would be three soldiers or two soldiers and a dog. We'd do what we wanted to do to prevent the infiltration. And so my sense is the Israelis are the ones who are going to have to live with the alternatives if they screw this up. If they further anger the Palestinians and destroy the moderates in Palestine and have another 20 years of war, they're going to be stuck with the consequences. On the other hand, if we push them, oh no, you shouldn't have a wall, and horrible, horrible things happen in Israel as a result, they're also going to have to live with that consequence. And in the same way that we wouldn't ask for a show of hands about how to defend ourselves from terrorists, I don't think we should be telling them what to do on that. Um, the very last thing is on Iraq. Um, you know, I spoke before many of these forums, forums before the war, and I thought the war was a terrible idea beforehand. I still think the war was a terrible idea. I don't think it served U.S. interests. And while the specific bad things that happened are always hard to predict ahead of time, I guess the argument was a lot of bad things could happen. Some subset will probably happen, and it doesn't look worth it to me. That said, as Shelley said, this is where we are now. And for a variety of reasons we could talk about, I think the only thing to do in Iraq now for the time being is try to build up the current Iraqi government and security forces to the point where they may, may be able to stave off the nasty civil war that looks like it's coming. And meanwhile, and, and when we can do that, then get out. I, for ethical reasons only, I wouldn't argue for pulling out today because I think that we would have the blood of millions of people on our hands if we did. Um, in, in sum, um, my sense is that neither the left nor the right in the political debate in this country is frankly being straight with us about our Middle East options. Um, the left wants you to believe that our only solutions are to kind of condemn and curb Israel and to free ourselves from oil, that those are the things. We should all be driving, I don't know, hydrogen power cars and, and, you know, and, and you know, condemning Israel, that would solve it. The right is saying the only solution is to topple dictatorships and either democratize or control the region. And you know, you're free to go down either of those paths. This is a democracy. But I guess what I was trying to say is I think that neither of these positions is right. I, neither of these positions is best for this country that the spread of democracy, whether it's in the Persian Gulf region or the Middle East or anywhere else, is a good thing. It's good for the local people. I think it's even good for us. But we don't have to do this by force. I mean, the nice thing about our ideology is unlike communism, unlike Nazism, it doesn't seem to be, have to be spread at the point of a gun. People seem to want it. Not all people, not in every country, not now, but it's spreading. So my sense on democratization is great. When somebody chooses to overthrow their dictator, support them, give them aid, help them with development projects. Um, number two, exercising control, trying to control the Persian Gulf region is dangerous because it foments the kind of terrorism that, that we don't want to get stung by, and it's unnecessary. And then finally, number three, the principal thing connecting us to this rather violent, unhappy region of the world is oil. But the good news is that on this measure, we can get what we need we can get what we want without controlling the region and without keeping a U.S. military presence there. Thank you. We'll take a 30-second break to let those people that need to exit the room exit, and then we'll see if people have questions.
had a dully mixture of sweets. So. Okay. I think there's a question about three rows from the back. If you could just uh, stand up and just let us know who you are. Yes. Uh, name is Bill Jackson. I live in Lebanon. I have the pleasure of um, hearing other panel discussions, including one, I believe it was two or three years ago, in which one of the panelists uh, produced a schematic at the end, in which he was looking at the outcomes uh, of the war, um, and the, the more favorable one that uh, was that uh, we would end up with a friendly government, and then it went on through various degrees to the last possibility, which seemed at that point in time to be less uh, probable, which was chaos and civil war. I would like to take the panel uh, uh, to task or challenge them to look at the possibility, which seems to me to be more than remote, in fact, quite strong, that either with the US military there or after they leave, we're gonna be facing chaos and civil war. And what, what does that bring? And, and what does that tell us about the wisdom of, of getting in there? Thanks, Thanks very much. much. Who would like to? <laughs> I was not that person, of course, because I wasn't working here. But I just want to say one thing, um, that Iraq is heading towards a civil war and that there is increased uh, stratification along ethnic lines is a reality. That the U.S. administration occupation encouraged that by, the, you know, appointing the governing council according to sectarian lines and publishing in the newspapers so and so Kurd, so and so Shiite. While I was there filming the documentary, everyone said, "Why are they publishing these things?" One important thing: without a middle class, a large middle class, as I said, most of of which is outside the country you cannot have a, a, a healthy civil society that will rebuild itself. The world is not you know, like a, a chessboard that you ch change things like that. The consequences of 35 years of certain policies will be with us. Now, we all want a democratic society in Iraq, but the reality is the man calling the shots now is someone called Grand Ayatollah Ali Assistani, who has a turban and he has a beard. Now, uh, the reality is Iraq is becoming a theocracy. And I want to add one more thing, whether we like it or not. The, the short memory span is, is scary in this country. Bremer wanted to have caucuses. They did not want to have man, one man, one vote, one woman, one vote. It went on for five or six months. Bremer wanted caucuses, whereby people would be appointed by the US, people who are uh, pro-US, and then these people would choose the assembly. It was Ali al-Sistani the turban clergyman, and I myself, I'm a secular person from a Christian family, so I'm not, I'm not in love with, 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 uh, with the turban men. It was Ali al-Sistani who insisted in his declarations that there must be elections in Iraq like the ones we have in the United States. He said that, and he threatened that he would issue a fatwa for the Shiites who follow him to resist the United States with arms unless that. So Bremer and Bush succumbed. But when the elections took place, the Bush administration took credit for it. I mean, we have to contend with that. So I am sorry. Had it been up to Bremer and Bush, there would not have been the kind of elections we saw in Iraq. So we can't assume this divine messianic thing where everything that's good in the world is because of us, and everything that's bad is because of something else that went wrong. Thank you. Um, a, cu a couple things very quickly to try, uh, also try to respond to that. Um, I, think, I think mine was, was the talk that you referred to. Um, uh, I guess I'd say three things is, is one, um, for predicting how things are going in the war now is very, very difficult. I have, I have my hunches and I'll tell you what that is in a, se in a second and why I believe that, but there's no crystal ball. I mean, I think there are two groups of people in the world, those who pretend that they know the future and those who admit that they don't, and that's it. And um, I'm wrong about a lot of things, but I'll tell you the truth, I'm right about one thing, which is I don't know the future. <laughs> I'm right about a second thing, too, which is no one else in this room does either. <laughs> How the Iraq war is going to end up, it's uncertain. If I were a betting man, if I were forced to bet my car or my house on it, I don't think this is going to end up well. 
Um, I would invite you to look at a, a bunch of data, which seems to be updated almost daily, which you can find online by the Brookings Institute. Um, if you do a Google search under Iraq index, they track everything from US casualties and fatalities over time to estimates of insurgent numbers to number of attacks, et cetera. So I would send you to Iraq index. But basically, let me kind of correct two misperceptions that I think that are out there that suggest that we're doing better than we are. One is um, there's perception that we're doing great on rebuilding infrastructure. Um, it's always hard to tell because there are cyclical effects on energy and oil production as well as, as, as the ones over time. But relative to a year ago, electricity production in Iraq is down 33% relative to a year ago. Oil production is down 20%. Those aren't good signs. Um, we frequently like to pretend that basically the people were typically were mainly fighting in Iraq are, are, are Al-Qaeda folks. And basically the idea is, hey, look, we have to fight them anyway. <laughs> Better that they come to us in Iraq than they come to us in Boston, right? Problem is we don't know how many additional Al-Qaeda recruits we're creating, first of all. And second of all, at least if you believe the CIA and the US military, and they might be wrong, is they both tell you that 90% of the, of the hardcore insurgents are Iraqis, not foreign fighters. So that's a problem. Um, the, the last thing I'd say on this, on this um, thing is we've played a rhetorical trick here that makes it sound like we're going to win this war. We might, but I'm skeptical. And that is we refer to the Iraqi resistors as Ba'athists. And it's just like, like um, Rumsfeld referred to them in the past as dead enders. And basically what we're trying to say is these are the guys who are still fighting for Saddam Hussein. And the implication is, guess what? They're not going to recruit very many additional people. So as we kill them or destroy them, we're going to win the war. I think that we're playing a semantic game here. I think it's more accurate to say that the people we're fighting against are Sunnis. They're Sunni Iraqis. And maybe some of them are fighting because they have some love in their heart for Saddam Hussein or Tariq Aziz or someone else in the old regime. My guess is that they're fighting because they're afraid that democratization will work. They're afraid that they're going to end up living in a, in a democracy or something like a democracy run by the Shias who they murdered for 30 years. And that some of these guys are thinking, geez, what if the Shias are remotely as bad to us as we were to them? Try better get the Americans out quickly, better try to retake this country, or maybe try to get out of the country. So I'm more skeptical than, than most, although I don't, have a, I don't have a crystal ball. In the back. My name is Brian I'm Dr. My question is to uh, You're not happy with the Americans pushing for democracy in Iraq. You're not happy with the American role in the past. You mentioned that they supported Buhabi, they supported Sadat, they supported many <coughs> dictators. But you're not happy now they're pushing for democracy in the Middle East. So I don't know what, what you guys want. I know you, you're representing kind of, kind of certain thinking. So you're not happy with that outcome in the Middle East. You, don't, you, you want America to get out of Iraq as far as possible. And, uh, you also argue that America established a secretarian government in Iraq. But think of which, which was secretarian? A government dominated by one man with his tribe, with his region, or a multi ethnic government as now represented by Jaffari government. So I don't know, since I met you, you've been sticking to this emotional outlook. You don't see anything good going on in Iraq, but I wonder like, when you're going to look for the budget to start. Thank you. I am a person who hates democracy and gets really upset when, when I see it anywhere across the world. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> We've had many discussions. Look, look, I am a, I'm a secular person uh, who is not nationalist, and it's, it's ridiculous to assume that people hate the spread of democracy. I am all for the spread of democracy. But I, I guess I didn't make the point clear in my talk. On the surface level, on the discourse, the US says it's spreading democracy in the Middle East. But I am telling you that now Qaddafi, the madman of the Middle East who bombed planes, is back in business. He's a good guy. Uh, Mubarak, who is grooming his son to become president, is our ally. Uh, in Iraq, you cannot have, I want democracy in Iraq and everyone else, everywhere else as much as you do. You cannot have democracy under military rule. You cannot have that. <laughs> History tells us otherwise. You cannot have an imperial power, and of course we never mentioned the word empire today. 
We are living in an empire. The United States is an empire. And empires, if you, want, if you believe in empire, you have to know there is a certain cost to be paid by empires. Sadly, in this country, the people who are paying the cost of empire are the working class, mostly the minorities, people who live in White River Junction. That's why the war can go on, because the middle class is largely shielded from it. So we can go on shopping, and the war is a distraction. Going back to the multi-ethnic, I, I was always against Saddam, my friend, while we were in Iraq. I have written many articles against Saddam. I'm all for a society where the Shiites, more than anyone else, take their right lightly place, but a society that is a civil society based on citizenship. Unless we base our societies on citizenship, the road is towards civil war. Yes, the sufferings of the Shiites and their power must be restored. But if you read the way it's talked about, it's they, they divide the, the ministries just like Lebanon. The defense has to go to a Shiite. This has to go to a Kurd. And the whole rhetoric in all over Iraqi society is completely sectarian. And Kirkuk is an example. If you read the uh, reports in The Economist, for example, it's a ticking time bomb. It's true Saddam had uh, dominated by a Sunni, the Sunni minority, but it was more about power. Tariq Aziz was a Christian. He was the foreign minister. Mohammed Hamza Zubaydi, who led the massacres in the south, was a Shiite. I'm sorry, going back to the insurgents. The insurgents is not based on Sunnism. It's based on power and interest. I'm sorry to take a lot of your time, but I have to say this. When the United States entered Iraq, uh, the policy was to debathify, and I am against the bath. But Bremer's idea, based on the opinions of two Iraqi Americans who told him that you have to debathify because the bath is like Nazi Germany, that is disastrous because the bath is, is terrible, but it's not like Nazi Germany. And also, we have to ten, contend with the other problem. You, you, we can't decide for 25 million people based on two people. That's the problem. But the, the, all of these people, the insurgents, are not just the Sunni necessarily. It's not Sunni based. It's based that they were all working in the intelligence and military apparatus of the party. But the important thing that why did we have two, three months right after the occupation where no one was doing operations against the United States? Many of these people, look, they are people who are willing to work with the system, like all over the world. People change their ideology overnight and work with the system. Many of them were willing to work with the new regime. And we have now in this government people who are Baathists, who are taken back. But when Bremer's policy of debathification basically told these people that you will never get any kind of job in the new regime, you will not get monthly payments, and most of these people still had their weapons. If you want to debathify them, why don't you take their weapons? And they number somewhere close to 800,000, each having a family of four or five, with their weapons still intact. You go at night, and we have reports now, you, you terrorize them in their houses, you have wrong lists, you intimidate them. These people could have been won over. This is the, I'm sorry, the idiocy of the American policy in Iraq, is that aside from all ideological considerations, these people could have been integrated to the new regime, but the United States did not use the three-month window of opportunity. You might say that Baathists can never work again because they were once Baathists. Why was Iyad Allawi chosen by the United States to be the interim prime minister? He was a Baathist. He was a Saddam henchman in Europe. So either we are against the Baathists or we're with them. But I fear for what will happen in a society and a culture which I, works and the mechanisms are all sectarian. I mean, I, I don't ever bring that up, but you know what's happening to, to a lot of Christians in, in the South, in Basra. You know how the bombings are all going back and forth on sectarian basis. Where will this lead us? We know what happened in Lebanon for 15 years. So it's not that I'm not happy about democracy. This is ludicrous. Most people on this planet like democracy. But you're waiting for Libya to have a democracy and for Iraq to get democracy. No, but I'm mentioning Libya as an example that the United States does not. Policy in Saudi Arabia and to solve the Palestinian problem, the eternal one, and then Iraq can have democracy. This is, cannot happen. No, of course Why not. Can not can I'm just going to interject here. Mr. Goodman, did you have something you want to add? Well, I would first take a strong <laughs> issue with the idea that the United States is an empire. Are we talking about the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, or what are we talking about? We're not an empire. And we're very, re we're very reluctant to be where we are on many occasions, and we are certainly sworn to getting our troops out when asked by the elected Iraqi government to do so. So I don't, I don't think it's fair to, to, to look at us as, as an empire, at least in uh, my understanding of what empire means. What, what strikes me always is that the U.S. is, and I, and I hear it here today, the U.S. is always doing th everything, virtually everything wrong. But the U.S. has given Iraq a chance 
for democracy. The fact that the U.S. Has, has embarked on a policy that it has has had repercussions all over. You know, some rumblings of de democratic change, even in Saudi Arabia, even in Egypt. Lebanon is now free of, of Syria. Libya has renounced its interest in nuclear, in nuclear, uh, a nuclear program, weapons program. And, and yet all I hear is the United States is stupid, the United States, Bremer is an idiot, Bremer shouldn't have done this. But where is, where is the understanding of what the United, the opportunity that the United States is offering to this region of the world, which has been under the dictatorial boot for how many years? Um, at least there is something positive to be said about what we're doing, and at the same time, where is the question about who are these people who are setting off uh, themselves as suicide bombers and the people who are, who are encouraging them or training them or enabling them to do that? What do those people conceivably offer to any country in the region? What do they offer? A return at least to something as bad as Saddam Hussein and that kind of a regime. Is that what you want? Where is the criticism of these people? Where is the criticism of people who have absolutely no program except destruction? Go to the, go to the, uh, to the World Trade Center ground zero and see what they do. But ask yourself, what do they do positively? Can they build anything? These people have nothing to offer and they should, if, if we were of a, genuinely interested in democratic process in those countries, we would be highly critical of them. Our press would be highly critical. Our media in general would, and I don't hear that. I think we have time for a, 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 one more question here on the right. So quickly, I find it as, as sort of depressing as it is predictable to hear people talking about the spread of democracy by the United States government, by the political process here and the foreign policy of the United States, as being, well, that the spread of democracy is a goal or even characteristic of the history of the United States, say, since the Second World War. I mean, regardless of whether one might like that to be the case or not, it's a fairly straightforward case to make that that has never been the goal of the United States, certainly since the Second World War. And for every supposed example of that that one might be able to come up with, there are dozens of examples which certainly prove quite the opposite. And so I find it interesting, similarly depressing, that someone who's been such as Mr. Griffin, who's been in service, the Foreign Service of the United States for 45 years, can actually say something like that. But I guess that's just the, 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 the party line right now. But I wish that people start talking about, or when people talk about the spread of democracy as being the goal of the US government, they would back that up with some real evidence that that is in fact happening. When one talks about uh, deposing dictatorial regimes, when we give example after example after example of the dictatorial regimes that have been installed by the United States government, example after example, which have served the interests of the wealthy elite and the big business interests of the United States, and certainly Iraq is no, no counterexample. What do you repeat? Um, I concur that uh, democratization is a long game, not a short game, and that it's much like adoption or having children. They're there forever, and as they get older, they become kidults and take more effort and time. Um, as a result, I would, my, my um, spin to try and deal with the, the mealy faces is to suggest that lessons have to be learned and where can we learn lessons from. Um, will there be a, a civil war in Iraq? If I had to bet and I don't, I would say yes. It will be nasty if it is, it will be brutish, and we just hope it will be very short. Um, I would argue that what happens is likely to be based on the issue of elites, how elites carve up the, the cake, that they, the pie that they, they will inevitably share, the ramifications for the people, the fact that civil society takes so long to rebuild. Um, democratization is not a, um, Mr. Goodman suggested that uh, peace in the Middle East had stopped and then started. I would argue that peace in the Middle East was much like my brother's chat up lines as a kid. My brother would see a good looking girl, he'd turn off his watch, he'd go and visit her and say, you've made time stand still. I think the US was responsible for, I think the US was responsible for making time stand still in the Middle East for a long time. And I think to fast track it is unfair. There's a, there's a, there's a way of, of state building and state build, building is long and arduous. If there's a civil war, it's our responsibility to, 
do the best we can. The lessons we can learn are to try and mitigate what happened in Yugoslavia, learn lessons from the propositions that were made in Northern Ireland where interested states cooperate and collaborate to be able to facilitate some kind of long-term mechanism to facilitate sensible, considered change that facilitates a, some form of consolidated democracy over time. It's a long, it's a long war. It's a long peace. We have time for... Where is it? Excuse me. Pardon me. We have time for one last question, and the gentleman in the olive jacket will have the last question, not the last statement. No, I would like to respond to the gentleman on my left in both respects, who I think knows very little about Eastern European and Russian history, and I happen to be from Eastern Europe. Yes, Americans occasionally have sided with their own regimes, we all know that. But just as often, they have supported democracy. And if it wasn't for American Congress and the State Department, Mr. Goodman's colleagues who met with dissidents, like myself and my parents, who supported solidarity in Poland, uh, and if uh, President Reagan hadn't stood up to Gorbachev, you know, at least my corner of the world would still be communist and it would be a rotten place to live in. So I just want to take issue with this notion that we never support democracy. I would like to say that. Excuse me. Aren't we willing to book those bets that you two want to make on whether there's going to be a civil war or not? I'll give you the name of my book. Un unlimited <laughs> amounts of money, okay? okay. You both need to bet. And I appreciate Mr. Altoon's respect for democracy and love for democracy. And as long as he runs the place, the fact that all these guys are sitting around talking and horse trading, and there's 150 newspapers there babbling at each other and criticizing everybody is democracy. And it's not the democracy that you would put in place if you had the power to, but it is democracy. Thank you very much. Mr. Well, Press, thank you. you have the last word. Excellent. Um, I would like, I, would, I think the gentleman's question on my right, your left, is, is both helpful and I think though at the same time it, it somewhat confuses. It's helpful because I think what he, the point that he's making, if I may, is that yes, we have sometimes been on the side of democracies, but he was making a, a, an argument about motive and intention and saying that the fact that we supported democracy in Eastern Europe might have had something to do with the Soviet Union was there and we were concerned with the power relations. And so the point the gentleman was making is more often than not, and he would say always, whenever we've supported democracy, it was because it was convenient and when it wasn't convenient, we supported dictatorship. So it was about our past behavior. To that, it's helpful. I think it's not helpful in a different respect, which is it confuses us. And here I take exception with other people on the panel, which is all too often people argue about history and the question of did we or did we not you know, stand for democracy in West Germany or was Jap um, democratization in Japan, was that about democratization or about something else and we can argue about this forever. But that's not the question that you need to answer. I mean you can answer that for some history class or for some political science paper that I assign you. But that's not the real question you need to answer. The real question you need to answer is not did we in the past, but should we right now and in the future? Should we right now and in the future use the tools of American foreign policy, the broad set of tools, to try to topple dictatorships and promote democracy? Even those who are lovers of democracy, and that probably includes virtually if not everyone in this room, have a tough question to answer, which is should we promote democracy <laughs> through our example and through our aid and through our development assistance? Or should we do all those things plus topple dictatorships? And that's the real tough cleavage. So I think you're exactly right in describing US motives. The Cold War was about beating the Soviets, containing communism, containing the Soviet Union, and we did it. Fine, that's done. The question now is should we be using American military force as a tool of democratization or are you willing to support democratization simply by these other tools? Or perhaps you don't give a darn about democratization. Those are the choices that really you have. Thank you very much. And thank all of you for coming. <laughs> <laughs>